Well, who is excited to be in church today? Man, I am so excited to spend time with you. And you know what? I know somebody else is excited to spend time with you today as well. His name is Jesus. And his presence is here today. He wants to have an encounter with you. I'm so excited. We're going to have a great time in worship. We're going to have a great time getting into God's word today. And I believe we're going to have an awesome uh, just time with Jesus to be able to take his word and apply it to our life today. My name is Eric. I'm the lead pastor here. If you're a guest with us, it's great to have you here. If you're joining us online for the first time, awesome to have you with us as well. You can find out more information about our church at hillsideassembly.org. We'll do our offering at the end of service. It'll be the last thing that we do. We'll pray over that, and you can give in our box in the foyer. You can give anytime online at hillsideassembly.org. Hey, before we do anything else today, I think we need to pray uh, because we've got some people that are leaving for a trip uh, to go do some missions work tonight. And Nick is here. So Nick, can you come up front? Because we want to pray for you. And so uh, Nick, remind everybody where you and Michaela are headed off to with Mandy and a couple other students. The Dominican Republic down right, right so that's on the same island as Haiti. And you guys are leaving tonight, right? Yep, tonight at midnight. So yeah, so we're going to pray. But you know, midnight? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I feel like you guys are like, like modern day Acts disciples here, that's, leaving at midnight. That's to just go on when the we're leaving Ripon. The flight's, so, the flight's not till after that. So <laughs> I'm glad I'm not driving. <laughs> hey, but we were talking this week, and, and a few months back, we were talking about God's timing. And you know, I know we've, we've been really disappointed about uh, you've had a heart to go to Japan. You've been raising money to go to Japan. You're really close to, to getting your budget filled, and the doors just have been closing and closing and closing, but you got a phone call this week. You want to share with the people what, uh, what we found out? Yeah, they want me in Japan the first week of October this fall. Oh. Yeah. Come on. We get a little excited about that. Uh, hey, would you stand to your feet really quick? We're going to pray for Nick, Michaela, and the ministry team today. Lord, we just thank you so much. God, we love you. We love missions. We want to see people's lives touched and changed for the gospel. And Lord, this morning we pray over Nick and Michaela, Lord Mandy, and the rest of the missions team. You've called them for such a time as this. Lord, I pray be with them as they leave here at midnight. That God, there would just be angels surrounding their vehicle, surrounding their flight. God, that you would put them exactly where they need to be when they need to be there. God, I pray they would see great and mighty things for your kingdom. That God, as they are teachable and humble and serve you, that God, your spirit would go before them. It would pave a way. You would make a way where there is no way. You would do amazing things. And Lord, we celebrate with Nick as well. Lord, we believe that he is bound for Japan in October. Lord, we pray that the details as they come into place in the weeks to come, the Lord, you'd be prepping him for the mission to come. We give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Awesome, Nick. We can't wait for you guys to get back and give us an update on how things went. Uh, you guys can be seated because we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit, a couple announcements before we do worship today. Um, Nick was sharing with me what they're going to have him do over in, in Japan, and phew, luckily, they're going to have him teach a, a language he's fluent in. It's English, so... That's a good thing. It'd be really hard if they said, hey, we want you to teach Scandinavian. I would be like, what? Um, but hey, we're excited for you, Nick. A couple of announcements to, to make you aware. We want to remind you once again, camp registration is open for all of our students. So if you're interested in sending a student to camp, please uh, see uh, Hannah. I have to remember who's seeing who here, but we want you to see Hannah if you're interested in going to camp. Also, if you ordered a, mi a missions pizza a few weeks back, if you'd see Dawn Fader after uh, the worship experience today, she will help you connect with your pizza, uh, and obviously you need to pay for those as well. Uh, but see Dawn for that. Now, you may have noticed your bulletin's a little bit different because it is jam-packed with events for the summer on both sides. And I thought, you know what, we really need somebody to walk us through the summer calendar really quick before we go into worship. So let's have Jeb do that this morning with us. Well, good morning, Hillside. My name is Jeb. How are you doing this morning? 
Ooh, all right. Well, some of you woke up. You woke up on the right side of the bed. That's a good thing. Well, I'm excited because I get to be your host this morning to tell you all about our dates and events for the summer. And boy, do we've got some great things coming up here at Hillside. Are you ready? Well, first up on our list is we've got our great celebration banquet. It's Saturday, June 4th. It'll be at 5 p.m. Tickets for adults is $10. We're going to have a catered meal. Kids get to eat for free. But but you know what you need to do? You need to reserve your tickets today. See Miss Pam in the foyer. If you're planning to come, we want to make sure you get a ticket and a spot. And we want to make sure we've got food for you. So sign up today in the foyer with Miss Pam. Well, old Jeb here, he loves missions, and I know you do too. Well, we've got a one-day missions trip experience on Saturday, June 11th to City on a Hill. Mr. Jairo Granados is leading that team. If you're interested, see him today after the worship experience. On Sunday, June 12th at 10 a.m., we are celebrating our high school graduates. We're going to have a great recognition service. Don't miss it. Sunday, June 12th. Well, summertime is here and we're going to switch to outdoor services. That's right. Our outdoor worship experiences kick off on Father's Day, Sunday, June 19th at 10 a.m. In a few weeks, Pastor Eric's going to give you all the details. We're going to have some exciting things happening this summer at our services outdoors in the lower level. Well, everybody loves our Friday night worship nights, and they kick off on Friday, June 24th at 7 p.m. Come join us for a night of live music, testimonies, and missions opportunities. It all kicks off on June 24th at 7 p.m. Well, ladies, we haven't forgotten about you this summer because on July 16th, we've got a women's gathering plan. More information coming soon. Oh, oh, yeah, we still got more to go. Friday, July 22nd, we've got a concert right here at Hillside. The Southern Gospel Group Westward Road is going to be with us. Woo! That is going to be a time to scoot, shoot, and boogie. You won't want to miss that. Friday, July 22nd at 7 p.m. Now, camps and VBS are on their way. It starts July 25th through the 29th with Youth Camp. Followed by July 31st through August 4th, we're going to be doing VBS. If you'd like to work with VBS this year, you just need to talk to Miss Jackie about being a volunteer. And then on August 8th through the 12th, we've got Kids Camp. Woo! We've got a great couple of weeks there to do some things. If you're a kiddo or a teen in our church, we're going to have a great time this summer. And to end this summer... We've got a great event. We're going to end our summer with the church picnic and big bag tournament on Sunday, August 28th. Woo, man, that is a lot of stuff there, folks. I sure hope you enjoy all the things we get to do this summer together as we serve Jesus and reach our community. Well, old Jeb is wore out. I think I'm going to take a nap, but I think it's time for you guys to stand to your feet and worship. Let's go. Thanks, Jeb. There was a blind man that Jesus healed. This man had an encounter with Jesus, and then he was questioned by some of the authorities about being healed on the Sabbath and other things, and he said he didn't know a lot about Jesus at that point, but he said, this thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. And uh, in John 9, 35 and 38, Jesus later found him for a second encounter. Jesus heard that they had thrown him, the blind man, out. And when he found him, he said, Jesus said to the blind man, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I might believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. In other words, Jesus was speaking to him. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. May we also believe in Jesus Christ and worship him today. Amen.
You are not. 
just to invite you here. Lord, your presence is in this place today because your people have gathered together here. You are amazing. Lord, we just worship you for who you are. Lord, your word says, where two or more are gathered in your name, that you are there also. And we welcome you here, Holy Spirit. We welcome you here, Jesus. Would you move in our lives, in our hearts today? Lord, I pray for the preaching of your word that, God, it may be effective, powerful, 
pray for your presence to do what you want to do here in and through us. That God, there would be no hindrances to what you want to do. We pray over our children and their children's ministry today that God, you would move in their lives and their hearts. I believe our kids are ready for an experience with you today. God, we pray for anointing over every person here. Jesus, move in this place. Lord, we give you praise, glory, and honor. And God's people said, amen, amen. You can be seated today. I believe God's going to do something great. I think Jeb might be back from his nap. Let's, let's check. Well, good morning, and do you know what time it is? Well, that's right, it's time for Kids Church. So if all our kiddos want to get up on their feet and head to the back doors there in the center, that's where Miss Jackie is. It is time to go downstairs for Kids Church. Let's give our kids a cheer this morning. Woo! I'll see you kiddos down there. Bye! So excited for this morning. So excited for our kids. They are amazing. Um, we're going to set the tone for today's message. We are in the last three messages of a series called Just Like Jesus. We've been going through the Gospels. We've been primarily in Mark, but we've jumped a few other places. Just going through the, the life and the ministry of Jesus. Uh, in total, I think there are 70 or 71 messages in this series. This is the longest series I've ever preached in my life. Uh, that's why we're having a celebration banquet, because look, I finally made it through. Um, and you guys endured all these messages. But today is a special message. We're going to do our best to jump into somebody's heart and mind, which is a difficult thing to do, to kind of talk about the place that they were in. Guys, if you'd make that change to, to the lights here. Of all the messages I've ever preached in my ministry career, this is probably the most important. Because this has the potential to save your life. And it definitely has the potential to save your soul. It has the ability to step in, and, and, and I believe what God is going to teach us today has the ability to save your marriage, to save relationships. I believe it's powerful, and there's only one point to today's message, and it's this. Go back to what you know. We're going to pick up in John chapter 21, verse 1. And here's what it says. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. All of a sudden, all the fishermen in church are like, I like where this message is going. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord. <laughs> he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, and they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, 
and gave it to them and said the, said the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had appeared to his dis- disciples after he, raised, he was raised from the dead. Jesus had appeared to his disciples twice before this. We have been, we've been in that uh, series talking about that. Uh, he just kind of shows up in a room with the, the doors locked, but Jesus shows up. The last time we talked about this, we were talking about Thomas because he missed out on the first experience. But Jesus never leaves anybody behind. They had experienced this twice. The Lord had instructed his disciples to meet him in Galilee, which helps to, us to explain why they, were at, why they were at the Sea of Galilee. But John did not explain why Peter decided to go fishing. And I'm going to tell you, I don't think it had anything to do with fishing. The fact that he went fishing. Peter is in this very unique place. Just days before, he denied Christ three times. He had experienced the torture and the crucifixion of Jesus. While he may not have actually witnessed and seen it, he had definitely heard about it, and the weight of that moment was upon him. He had witnessed the empty tomb, and he had seen the resurrected Savior twice. And now he's in this strange spot. He believes in Jesus. He believes Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He believes Jesus as his Savior. He is there. He is, he's committed. He understands. He's got the knowledge. He's got the heart knowledge. But he still finds himself in an awkward place. Because while he believed in who Jesus was, Peter had no idea what to believe about himself. Where do I fit in anymore? Am I still called to ministry? In Matthew 16, Jesus said to Peter, I tell you that you are Peter. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Did that still apply to him? Even though Peter knew who Jesus was, he must have felt lost, confused, empty, a burden and a weight that he could not figure out how to bear nor how to process. And in the midst of this messy situation, Peter says this, I'm going out to fish. But an interesting thing happened. The men that were with him, these disciples of Jesus, said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat. But that night they caught nothing. My one point this morning is this, go back to what you know. Some believe that Peter had been called from the life of a fisherman, and he was. And for him to go back to fishing now was returning to a lifestyle he shouldn't return to. I I take issue with that personally. I don't think that that's that's correct. I, I do want to tell you, if you ever find yourself where you don't know what to do, we should not be running back to our sin uh, that Jesus has freed us from. That is not what we should do. I think that, that's, that's a, a good point to make here, but I don't believe applying that to this specific scripture is correct. Because here is the thing. This could not have been a sin that he was returning to because Jesus blessed Peter's endeavor. He multiplied the catch, and Jesus doesn't bless sin. So I think that's kind of faulty thinking and and faulty preaching to go down that road with this passage. When we're in a place like Peter, where we're confused, empty, scared, we, we need to go back to something. So what did Peter go back to? He wasn't going back to fishing. He was going back to the place where he found Jesus. The story that plays out here in John chapter 21 that we just read is almost identical to how an event that played out three years earlier in Matthew chapter 5 when Peter meets Jesus. Peter went back to his boat, the same boat that three years earlier Jesus stepped into, told him to cast away from the shore and to throw out his nets one more time. And when they did so, they called, uh, caught a multitude of fish. It says in that point that the nets actually started to break. This is where Jesus called Peter into ministry. 
It may have been in the subconscious, but I believe it was, he was being led by the Holy Spirit back to the place where he first met Jesus. After all, Peter may have been selected as a disciple because he owned a boat. All these messages that we've gone through a lot of the times when they were traveling, where did, how did they travel? In Peter's boat. I don't think it was so much the act of fishing. I think it was going back to a place where he knew Jesus met him. What does that mean for us today? What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to take away from all of this? All of us find ourselves in Peter's shoes from time to time. Seasons where we feel lost. Maybe sometimes we are spiritually lost. We, we've let our relationship with Jesus slide and lack. I can't remember the last time we actually had a conversation with the Lord or we got into our Bibles by ourselves. And, and that, that, that's one type of loss. But there's also the kind where you know who Jesus is, but you still feel aimless. Like you're not sure what to do, where to go. We're all going to be there at some point where we feel confused and burdened, unsure about what tomorrow will bring, broken and desperate. Let's just take the last word there, desperate. This year, I'll celebrate 25 years in ministry. I've been preaching for 25 years. Preaching, I started preaching when I was 19. Did not have credentials, but I had some pastors who believed in me and saw the potential for a calling. I'm not sure what they saw. <laughs> but they said, hey, we, we want you to start, st we want to start developing you because we feel like God might be calling you to preach the word of God. I'm so grateful for those people who gave me an opportunity. And that's why when I feel that the Lord shows me some individuals that, that have that potential, I want to do our best as a church to provide opportunities for them. Over the last 25 years, as I've, I've grown up in different churches and different ministries, I've had the opportunity to walk with several different people who call Jesus their Savior. And I've watched Christians sometimes in desperate situations do desperate things. And not always a good way. I, I think desperate can be one of two things. I think it can be something really positive for us, or it can be something very detrimental. And especially for us in the Pentecostal circle. And, and for those of you new, and, and you're like, what Pentecostal? I didn't even know we were Pentecostal. We are a Pentecostal church. And you might be asking yourself, what does that mean? I don't have time to take you down a whole lit litmus of, of what that d details, but let me put it in a nutshell for you this morning. We believe our relationship with God, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, is experiential. It's not something found merely through ritual or thinking. But that Jesus, it's, it, our relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit is interactive. Amen. I mean, that's, that's a kind of a basic breakdown of Pentecostal belief there, that this is an interactive experience. However, our experiences must be based on something solid, a biblical foundation. This is what we call biblical doctrine. I know really fancy words to basically say, we should be doing what this tells us to do. This is how we know when something's from God or when something's not from God. And I'm not saying that you can only have an experience with God that is, is black and white right here. I, I think God is infinitely creative, but the, the foundation must be upon the word of God. And we get really, we don't want to get out in the boonies of our, our spiritual thinking and find ourselves going, hey, this is a doctrine I believe, but there's not really a tie back to the scriptures. And we don't want to pursue things that are out here, not under the foundation of the word and make them priority in our life. I think that's a very dangerous place to be. I've seen people throw away biblical truth to chase after false hope of spiritualism with a Jesus fish bumper sticker on it. Let me give you an example. I've, over the last 25 years, I've watched sometimes people go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Remember a couple weeks back when we were talking about filling, we need our life filled with, with life. I used Fruit Loops as an example. I had the cups up here. Do you remember that? 
A couple people do. The rest of you were sleeping. That's okay. It's online. You can go watch it. And I, I really wanted to use Life Serial for that example because it just fits so much better that God gives us life. He pours life into us. But, but we had Fruit Loops because they were colorful. And that's okay because we want to have the fruits of the Spirit in our life. So that's good. And I know some people eat, eat, eat Cocoa Puffs. I'm not, I'm not debating with you whether or not you should or not. That's for Robin to preach on the next time he preaches. Um, but I think the thing is, is sometimes instead of filling our life with the things that we should be filling ourselves with from the Word of God, we fill our, our life with the spiritualism of Cocoa Puffs and we just kind of go cuckoo. I know this is a tough word and some people aren't going to like it. They might get mad at me. That's okay because I didn't write this. Jesus did. When you find yourself in this place, when people are, are taking verses out of, out of context to justify spiritual behavior or ideas, you, we can kind of call that maybe hyper-spiritualism. And, and where that comes from is poor spiritual truth, a poor understanding of the principles found in God's Word. Let me give you just a few examples. I can't possibly hit them all, and I may make some people in here upset. Again, I don't think this is coming from me. I think it's coming from God. So you need to take it up with him if, this, if any of this offends you. In recent years, there's been a, a thing that's started. It started off on, on the West Coast, but it has slowly progressed its way across the country and into some other countries as well. It's a practice called grave soaking where individuals will go out. They will find a man or woman of God who had a dynamic ministry, and they will go sit at their grave believing that the spirit that was once on them will somehow be saturated into them by sitting over their grave. Let me tell you, that is not a biblical principle, although they take a passage of scripture completely out of context uh, about when uh, Elijah had passed away, and they threw the bones of a guy down in this tomb because these guys were running away, uh, and they didn't want to get caught by the raiders that were coming. The body tumbled down into the grave, touched the bones of Elijah, and pff, the guy came back to life. Listen, God does great things, but these guys didn't go seeking that. And if you want an encounter with the Holy Spirit, ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit. Don't go sit on somebody's grave. That is, that is craziness. Uh, and it's also kind of really a demonic practice, to be honest. The name it and claim it doctrine, and I'm not going to go into a deep thing here, but really the name it and claim it doctrine is really, if we're really honest with ourselves, where that came from, if you do the history and, of, of where it came from, it really is, it has nothing to do with God's will. It has to do with our will, and we want to slap a Jesus sticker on it and go, this is what I want, Jesus, make it happen. We, we basically treat Jesus like Santa or a genie and say, make it so. When really the heartbeat of us as followers of Jesus should be a submission to Jesus to go, Lord, I want to step into what you have for me, not what I want to see happen. Some people have gotten into this praying upside down thing. I literally know people who do this. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, they believe if you pray upside down that somehow it, I don't know what it does, but they're into it. Not, not in the Bible. Praying in mantras or mantras, participating in Jewish rituals. This is a kind of a newer one. I guess it was popular back in the 70s too. Uh, but there is a movement right now that's sweeping across our nation that talks to, that people are saying, if we really want to be effective in our prayer life, then we need to start doing the Hebrew traditions. That's not biblical. That's not scriptural. It's not there. Yet they, they tie themselves down to this. Hyperspiritualism is a focus. They seem to be an overemphasis and focus on dreams, vision, and spiritual manifestations rather than the emphasis being on the Word of God. I'm not against any of the things I just listed. But this is the most important thing. The other things, this is the cake. The other things are the frosting. Stop eating just the frosting. It's not healthy for you. We've got to have the ground work of the Word of God. When you fall into hyper-spiritualism, you tend to focus on personal prophetic words. Again, not a problem that that, that, that that gift would be presented. I don't have a problem with that. But when that becomes more important than the Word of God. I talked with somebody who, who uh, went to a church in Omaha, a very prominent church, and they had gotten into a situation that the church was going through difficult times, and instead of going to the Word of God, they said, you know what? We're going to go back to the prophecies that were given to our church 15 years ago. We've got them in a safe. We're going to pull them out, and we're going to focus in on those. I'm like, 
ding, 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 you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Because that is not what the Word of God says. Because guess what? Men and women are fallible. This is not. And when we get in trouble, this has to be the foundation. I want to hear from God. When these people find themselves in this situation, they begin to become hyper-spiritual. There begins to be some things that we begin to see. There's a, uh, they, don't, they won't submit to any type of spiritual authority. They become unteachable, and that's against Romans 13. You should read that, because it talks about the fact that God puts people in our life, that we are supposed to seek wise counsel, that God puts these people in our life for a purpose and a reason. People who are hyper-spiritual take on a role of a victim most of the time. The pursuit of mystical experiences, spiritual delusions, rigid, logistic thoughts, and extravagant expressions of piety begin to take hold of their life. And here's what happens. These people become deceived. They get bitter. They lose their relationship with Jesus, though they think they have one. They become toxic, and they drag other people into their toxicity. Jesus, help us. That is not what we are called to be as the church. We're called to be bringers of life. But it's so easy when you are desperate to fall into the trap. And we run to everything else but running to God. It's a dangerous place to be at where we seek someone to bring a word to God to us rather than opening our Bibles and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And listen... I have been in places where God has brought people into my life and spoken a word. They haven't even realized it, but it has always confirmed what God has spoken to me in his word first. Every single time. Somebody comes up to you today and tells you, oh, you should sell all your possessions. Sell all your possessions, and you know what? Go with Nick to Japan. Listen, you had better heard from God first before you start doing that, right? Right? We need, to, we need to have the foundation of the word. When you're lost, confused, empty, a burden of weight on you that you can't figure out, God is calling you to come back to what you know, to come back to what is true. There are no quick fixes to a move of God. Hear me on that. There are no quick fixes to a move of God. There are no quick fixes to revival. I am not against camps. I am not against uh, presentations or conferences. I go to them myself. But if you want to see God move, you've got to do the work. And you've got to have a relationship with him. And you've got to seek his face. God is calling you this morning to come back to three things when you find yourself lost. So really quickly, I want to talk to you about these three things. It won't be long. I'm, I'm wrapping up. The three things are this, church, prayer, and the Word of God. I realize we're all here this morning. We're in this place. I know all of you. We have a relationship with God, but I don't know what tomorrow will, 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 tomorrow will bring. And there are times where things happen in our life that take us to places we never thought we would go or could go. If you ever find yourself distance from this church, maybe God moves you on to something, maybe there's a fallout, I never want that to happen, but it does happen, and you find yourself separated, with no church home, and you find yourself lost and lonely and burdened and broken, find a church. Find a church. Not a perfect church because there is no perfect church. What was Paul doing going back and going out in this boat with these guys? They were having church. Look who you got. You got Peter who denied Christ three times, failed him in such a dynamic way. You got Thomas who's got doubting issues. 
All these guys were broken. All of them were imperfect, but they were together in the boat. And you cannot tell me they weren't talking about Jesus. They had seen him twice, resurrected from the grave. That's what they were talking about on the boat. They were having church. They were having church. Find a church that loves God and loves people. Find a church that preaches the word effectively. It doesn't have to be the same way I do it. I hope that they do it differently because they need to do it like God tells them to do it. Find a church that loves, just loves God, that loves abounds. Find a church that has fruit. You don't need a church where they hang from the chandeliers. You need a church that loves Jesus. Everyone needs a shepherd, and so does your pastor. I have shepherds in my life. I have a phenomenal presbyter in our section. I've been talking with her several times in the last couple weeks. So grateful for a shepherd in my life. I've got a great superintendent in our district who I know on a personal basis and who I know prays for me. Like I pray for you. You need a shepherd. You find yourself far away. You find yourself lost. Find a church. Find a church. Prayer. Lost, confused, burdened, unsure, broken, desperate. You need to talk with God. Not the fancy prayers. Just your heart. God, I'm broken. God, I'm lost. Come find me. Those kind of prayers. The kind of prayers where you don't have words to say, but you just sit there and let the tears flow down your face kind of prayers. The kind of prayers when your kid's in the hospital and you're not sure if they're going to make it. Those kind of prayers. The real heart of you with the real heart of God. When you find yourself lost, it's time to pray. Go back to what you know. Communicate with God. When you don't know what to do, you don't know where to turn, when you find yourself lost, go back to the Word of God. Not a single verse not a verse taken out of context to justify your opinion, your belief, or your behavior, but the Word of God as a whole, in the center of your life. Balanced. Church, go back to the place where you found Jesus. I know some people would say, but Jesus can find you anywhere. That is absolutely true. But we're not Jesus. Go to the place where you can find him. And the church should always be a place where you can find him. And let me share this with you. The church is never a building. You are the church. We're the church. And when somebody comes in, when somebody visits us, when somebody hangs out with us, they should be able to find Jesus. They should be able to find him when we are together. Because here's the thing, when you find him, he can do what no one else can. When you find Jesus, he can put the things together that you couldn't. That's where Peter was. Jesus from the shore said, throw your net on the right side of the boat. And you'll find some fish. But really, you can find some of whatever it is that you need. When God speaks to you and gives you a command, you will be fruitful. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. 
I believe that today you're here. You know Jesus, but maybe you feel like you're empty. Your nets are empty. You're in the right place because Jesus can fill your nets. And why Peter, this crazy guy who always seems to get himself in trouble, he's like, hey, can I come out to you on the water? Can I walk on the water? Absolutely. This crazy guy. And one of the disciples says, it's Jesus at the shore. Why does he jump in the water and swim to the shore? Because in his desperation, he wants to be in the presence of When you're desperate, be willing to be in his presence. Because that's in his presence they got fed. In the presence of God, you will not go hungry. In the presence of God, you will be fulfilled. In the presence of God, there is direction. It let me tell you the one direction I will absolutely tell you when you're in the presence of God. It's behind Jesus. Because yeah. he is leading the way. Amen. I may not have a clue where to go, but all I got to do is stay in the presence of Jesus because he's been here before. He knows the way. He knows the way, church, for you. I cannot tell you what God is doing right now. I spent the last three days bawling my eyes out <laughs> and having no clue what God is doing. On Thursday, I sat in the row right behind where Robbie is by that window, and for 45 minutes, I could not speak. I just wept for our church. I spent all day Thursday trying to write this message, all day long, crying. At one point, I thought to myself, God, there can't possibly any be any more water in this body. I'm like, I'm pretty sure there's a stain by the window over there. I don't know. I don't. I'm not frustrated by it, because the one thing I know is I was in his presence. I want you to be able to experience Jesus like that. Because here is the thing. This week, a week from now, years from now, you'll find yourself in a place where you feel lost. And you got to learn how to get into his presence. Because in the moment, I may not be available. Our staff may not be available. In the middle of the night, Church isn't open. In the middle of the night, Robbie and Mike aren't going to show up to your house, Mike with his guitar, Robbie with his keyboard, and go, let's worship. Just that's, it'd be really weird if that happened. We've got to learn how to be able to get into God's presence without those things. And I, I, we are blessed. We are blessed with the musical talent in our church. So grateful for them. But I asked them this morning if they would just hold off for a minute. I'm going to play a worship song for you. I'm going to teach you something this morning that can save your life. And it's how to worship without a team. How to engage in worship when it's just you and God. The altar is open. These seats are open. You can stand. You can raise your hands. You can sing. We've got the words here. We just want to be in the presence of God for a minute. Because I believe God wants to do something in each one of you. Yeah. Every story here is different. Every situation that you're facing this week is different. But I'll tell you, God already knows. He just wants you to come back to what you know. He is Lord. And He is here for you. Guys, if you would put that worship song on. Again, you can stand. You can bow. You can come to the altar. You can do whatever you feel like you need to to just engage in God's presence.
joy every fear suddenly wiped away here in your presence all of my games now fade away Yeah. Uh-huh.
before you. There's nothing like being undone by the presence of God. If you're able, if you would just stand to your feet this morning. Worship team, if you'd get ready to come back to the platform. Sometimes in the presence of God, God will do a deeper work in you than you are aware of. At times it can feel like he is pulling things apart. But in the midst of that, he's operating on you spiritually in some deep areas. You're not always aware of what it is. I can't explain that to you. But I will tell you this, Jesus never left a patient on the operating table. Because when he's doing those things, when he goes in and he he goes to the deep places of your heart and your spirit and your mind, he will always stitch you back together. For somebody this morning, you just needed to hear that. Like maybe God's got you on the operating table. He's doing a work inside of you. You're not even sure you understand it. It's okay. It's okay. There's something going on in there, and God's bringing healing some way. And I will tell you, there's going to come a day when joy returns to you, when your nets will be overflowing, not with fish, but with life. If you feel comfortable, would you grab the hand or the shoulder of somebody next to you? Be appropriate. You do not stand alone in this place. Church, there may come a day where we go through some really hard things. I can't imagine them being much harder than they've been, but it can happen. When you find yourself there, Don't turn on each other. Go back to what you know. Stand with each other. Pray with each other. And seek the word of God for direction. Lord, this morning, so important, because we'll all be there. We will all go through seasons of loss. We will go through seasons of feeling uncertain, unknowing, confused. God, you need, we need your help to come back to what we know to be true. We don't want to get desperate and go fill our life with cocoa puffs and get off doctrinally and, and miss you, thinking that we're with you and we, we have no idea because we're not rooted in your word. God, we need your presence in our life. Lord, we stand together. We stand for each other. We stand and worship you. And Lord, we commit our life as a church to the preaching of your word effectively and to the reaching and the serving of our community for the gospel. Lord, I thank you. And I thank you for the broken hearts here this morning. That God, you will restore them. You will fill their nets to overflowing. But Lord, they need a word from you. They need a word from you each and every day. Lord, we thank you that we are here for each other. We love our neighbor and we pray a blessing over them this morning. God, fill their nets to overflowing. Fill their life full to overflowing. May the Spirit pour into their lives like never before. And God, I know this, the closer we get to you, the softer our heart becomes. If our hearts have gotten hard, if we've gotten prideful and arrogant, we need to spend time in your presence to soften this thing. Because our hearts should be getting softer and our arms larger to embrace more people into the kingdom. Lord, we give you praise, glory, and honor this morning. 
Church, if you have felt the presence of God this morning, would you just say amen? Worship team is going to lead us in two more worship songs this morning. Let's worship before we leave here, and we'll close in prayer in just a few moments. I surrender all. Sing it with us.
I don't know if you can sense it or not. I just want you to know you are loved by God. He loves you so much. And he's got you right now in the situation that you're in and the circumstances that you're in. He's got you. He's got you. The enemy will lie to you. He'll whip you up into a frenzy. But you know what? In the middle of a boat, in the middle of the water, that was back on Peter's boat, they found themselves in a storm when they were traveling with Jesus. The wind and the waves, they were ripping into that boat, and that boat was just rocking side to side. All the disciples thought, we are going to drown. Jesus was taking a nap because he had peace. Because God's presence was in the boat. The waves in your life, man, they may go crazy. The lightning may, may flash. The thunder may roar. But if God's presence is in your boat, you can find rest. Lord, as we leave this place today, God, I pray we leave with full hearts, full nets. God, a reminder that when we feel lost, confused, we need to go back to what we know. Our desperation should bring us back to the people who genuinely love us, the church. Our desperation should bring us to our knees in prayer and brokenness and just authentic conversation with you. Lord, when we feel lost, we got to dust off the cover of our Bible, open it up, read it, and apply it to our life to find the direction and to hear your voice speaking to us. We thank you we are equipped with the Holy Spirit to do the ministry we're called to do. And next week we will talk about how to launch into ministry. Lord, we thank you. God, you take broken hearts, you make them whole. Lord, we pray over our offering this morning. We want to give generously to your kingdom. God, with what comes in, may it go further. May we be able to do more than we ever thought possible for the kingdom of God. Lord, we believe great things are on the horizon, not just for our church, but for our community and the kingdom of God in our community. And Lord, we look forward to what tomorrow will bring because God, you are in control and on the throne. We give you praise, glory, and honor. And God's people said, if you've got a missions pizza, you need to see Don. If you, have, uh, if you want tickets to a uh, celebration banquet, my wife would be happy to help you in the foyer. Those of you who are going to have a meeting here in about a half hour, that'll be downstairs in the lower level. Guys, have a phenomenal rest of your weekend. We're praying for you. We love you. Sing that chorus. Come like a flood.